Tonight, catastrophic scenes in Hawaii as the death toll climbs. At least 36 people confirmed dead after massive wildfires burn across Maui. Harrowing videos showing people surrounded by flames on all sides, desperately trying to escape. More than 10,000 tourists evacuated, with many more still stranded at the airport. But major concerns tonight for the people who call that island home. Hundreds left with nothing after their houses went up in flames. Our team is live in the storm zone with full coverage. Also tonight, the shocking assassination in Ecuador. A presidential candidate shot dead on the street in the capital city just two weeks before the election. The suspects now in custody as President Biden sends the FBI to help with the investigation. Overseas, a high stakes prisoner swap set in motion. Five Americans now out of prison and under house arrest in Iran as the U.S. tries to negotiate their release. Where those talks stand at this hour. Twitch star Kai Sanat speaking out for the first time after his impromptu giveaway event sparked a massive riot here in New York City. His message to his fans tonight after they overtook the streets destroying property and what he's saying about the criminal charges he now faces. Plus streaming spike, Disney following in the footsteps of Netflix and Peacock announcing a major price hike for both Disney Plus and Hulu. So what is driving this upward trend and what can you do to keep those monthly payments under control. Good evening, I'm Ellison Barber, in for Tom Yamas. We begin top story tonight with the devastating scenes playing out in Hawaii as the death toll from those raging wildfires climbs. More than three dozen people confirmed dead on the island of Maui. With fears tonight, that number could rise. New video showing the terrifying moments flames tore through the historic town of Lahaina. Strong winds fanning those flames, sending sparks flying through the street. The fire spreading so rapidly, residents forced to flee at a moment's notice. Drivers recording their harrowing escapes as the flames closed in around them, and thousands of tourists caught off guard too, many of them still stranded in packed airports. Hawaiian Airlines offering $19 flights to help get people off Maui. The view from above revealing the scope of the devastation. Land that was once lush with vegetation, now just charred and gray. Hundreds of homes destroyed, so many people losing everything they have. Tonight, we've got a full team of reporters on the ground in Hawaii covering every angle of this disaster and the unfolding humanitarian crisis. NBC's national correspondent Miguel Almaguer leads us off. As homes erupted into fireballs, the fast-moving inferno obliterated everything in its path. This tropical paradise becoming a death trap for dozens who couldn't outrun the flames. Let's go out! After this terrifying, heart-pounding scene to evacuate, authorities now confirm at least 36 fatalities, the second deadliest blaze in recent U.S. history. No communication whatsoever. Susan Matera's son, Matthew, is still among the missing. Just know your family and friends are reaching out to everybody. Your face is out there. We will find you. And just know that we love you. Matthew lived here in Lahaina, the historic town in ruins where nearly 300 structures were swallowed by flames and engulfed in smoke. It's all gone, man. The fire devoured homes in minutes. Neighbors say it jumped from house to house and then block to block. Many say the flames were out before firefighters even arrived. Woke up this morning and got on our phones to pictures of our house uh, just down to the slab. Inside these charred homes and incinerated cars, authorities believe there may be more bodies to recover and more heartbreak to share. We've been pulling people out since last night trying to save people's lives. And I feel like we're not getting the help we need. A popular, colorful beach town, this is what Lahaina looked like and what's now left today. Here at the harbor, residents say more bodies are washing up along the shore. As the fire came across this area, victims say they were running as fast as the flames. Many jumped right into this harbor to save their lives. Once it came from this direction, I decided at 7 p.m. it was too much and time to go because I could hardly breathe. Patrick Sullivan lives steps from the beach and lost it all. How do you describe the emotions that you're feeling right now? Uh, 
well, right here, it's pretty tough. <laughs> but uh, we'll be okay. We'll make it. With Maui in misery, tonight three separate firefights are still underway. The National Guard making progress, but there remains no cause for the fires, only reassurance from the president. Anyone who's lost a loved one whose home has been damaged or destroyed is going to get help immediately. But for so many, help won't ease the heartbreak. Chemo Kirkman lost more than just his home in the fire. His father's ashes are also gone. And now he's just in the ground with all the other ashes. I was talking about pictures, old pictures, and I found some of these old pictures, and I said, well, I should take a picture of it. And I'm so thankful I did, because this is the only thing I have now. Now, there is some good news from this particular fire that is burning. It's roughly 80% contained. The bad news, the reason why that containment is so high, because so many homes here have been destroyed. This fire really could not burn many more properties in this area, but crews are making progress. Ellison. Miguel Almaguer in Lahaina, thank you. For more on the devastating impact of these wildfires, I'm joined now by wildfire survivor Jack Starr. He and his wife have lived in Lahaina for 43 and 32 years, respectively. Jack, first, I just want to thank you so much for speaking with us tonight. I cannot imagine the pain, the fear, the trauma your family has experienced these past few days. Let me just start with what is most important tonight. Are you and your family safe? Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. We are. We're in just beautiful uh, company with friends that we've known for years that have taken us into their home. Um, the Aloha spirit is alive. Um, we're, we're definitely in a state of shock. We're still a bit numb. Um, we are trying to look into the bright side that we're, we're alive. We lost um, a couple of our neighbors that we've known for over 40 years, and uh, they were found in their vehicle, and they were passed away. The smoke was so thick, um, I don't think anyone could survive. Um, that particular home was a beautiful beach home that they built themselves. It was so cute. I could see how they wanted to stay to try to save it, but at what cost? And we're just devastated by their loss. I'm so sorry for your loss of your friends, of your home. Can you Thank take you. us to back to the last couple of days, the moment when you and your wife started to realize that things were getting really dangerous where you live and that you needed to evacuate, leaving, that had to be a hard choice. Sure. It was interesting for us because it didn't start out as a fire. It started out as um, severe winds. And Dora, the hurricane, we knew that it was 500 miles away and that we were going to receive some um, unusual higher uh, velocity winds. But when we woke up at 4.30 in the morning and heard shingles coming off our roof, the electricity had gone out. We went, OK, this is a little more severe than we thought. Um, by mid-morning, we had made a decision, a couple of our friends down towards uh, the beach area, about, I don't know, 15 blocks away from us, had uh, solar, and they had had the Tesla batteries. So they were cooking. They had television and air conditioning. So we said, hey, let's grab um, the dog and head down there and hang out for a couple hours. While we were down there, we smelled smoke. And this is what we call close to Baby Beach, uh, the Mall Wharf area. And, oh, my God, it happened so fast. We were looking out the window, and we saw plumes of black smoke, and we were saying, I think that's coming from our, our home area. And then the next thing we knew, we walked away, came back 15 minutes later, and it was engulfing the neighborhood down by Baby Beach where we were. And the folks we have have a one-year-old, they're all, we gotta get out of here. We jumped in our cars and everybody in that little neighborhood was scrambling to try to get out of the neighborhood. It, was, it wasn't pretty. Um, I will say people were, were cool. They were friendly, we were allowing people in. It looked like a rush hour at the airport. Some were in cars, some were just grabbing their suitcases and you could see them walking and rolling by in the smoke. And um, we couldn't go back to our home. 
Uh, we had a cat up there. We didn't take the cat with us. We thought we'd be home in two hours. I tried the, to talk to the police officer, try to get back up there to save our cat, and uh, he would not allow it. They were pushing all the traffic north going to what we call the um, Kaunapali, Honokawai, Kahana, Napili area. They herded all of us from Lahaina there. I must say, the Lahaina area is is really um, all workers. That mm -hmm. All of the homes, and I want to say there's 150 to 200 homes that have been lost, and we're all, we're all blue-collar workers. We're in the industry of Aloha. We're service people. Um, they're builders. Um, we all live here full-time. So um, it's devastating. We, uh, we got up north and we, we got to Maui Prep High School where they made a makeshift shelter, met some of our friends. We were still in disbelief. I, I really, my wife said, I think our house is gone. I, I said, I don't believe our house is gone until I see it. And, uh, but we started talking to people that were a little more informed than us. Because again, we weren't in our neighborhood. We were 15 blocks away and I was, what they were telling me, and I work at Chemo's on Front Street. I've worked there for 43 years. They said, <laughs> they said it was gone. I couldn't believe it. So here we are. We're trying to look at the bright side. We have insurance. I saw the um, declaration by the president that they'll allocate money to help rebuild our town. We've been through hurricanes and things before. We call it line of strong. And I believe that we will persevere. The Aloha spirit is strong. The community is strong. We're a small little beach community. And, uh, and I think that we will come out of this thing better, stronger, and uh, revitalize uh, our, our industry for the visitors to come to this great town of Lahaina, which is a um, historical town. Yeah. So. Do you feel confident, Jack, that you and your community will get the help you need to rebuild, to survive the immediate days? Well, that's one of the reasons that I took this call. I, I very much uh, speak for, I think, many people in our community. Communication is everything. And, and we, we, I know we don't have cellular right now. Towers are down. I think they said 80 poles just in Lahaina uh, were on the ground. There's a lot of work to do. Um, I know FEMA has arrived. Um, we're so happy about that. I heard rumor. I'm on the other side of the island at uh, a friend's home. I'm hearing rumor we're going to head back that way to go through the rubble of our property when we're allowed to. Um, but I believe that we're going to be um, OK in the long run. All right, Jack, thank you so much for sharing your story and giving us a better sense of what that community is like, because it's so easy for us to look at these stories and think we're talking about numbers, numbers of houses, square footage, but we're talking about people, people like you, and you really reminded us of that tonight. So, Jack, thank you for being with us. We appreciate it, and we wish the best for you and your family. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Aloha to everybody. Mahalo. Tonight, we are hearing more stories of survivors like Jack recounting the unimaginable loss and terrifying escapes as the fires destroyed everything in their paths. NBC's Dana Griffin spoke with some of them today and has their harrowing stories. As daylight exposes the scarred skeleton of a prosperous tourist town, it's all gone, man. the people who thrive off the land are gutted. It's like an apocalypse. Mason Jarvie has the burns to prove he barely escaped. We just had the worst disaster I've ever seen. All line is burnt to crisp. A paradise turned overnight into an inferno. Residents forced to flee in terror. We thought we were okay, but then the wind came, the gas stations blew up, everything caught fire by the brush, and then we just had to evacuate. Some jumped into action, warning others of the rushing flames. The fire's on Front Street. It's time to go. We've been pulling people out since last night, trying to save people's lives. And I feel like we're not getting the help we need. Thousands evacuated. This was a home. With no guarantee they'll have anything to go back to. Pretty much everybody I know uh, lost everything that we have. Many left with only their harrowing tales of survival. We just barely got out. There were, there were ashes, embers, everything flying through the air. 
Martha Roberts and Bill Thornquist lost it all. They had to walk 15 miles to find safety. Is there anything from your home that you're going to miss? So it was the feeling of security of locking the door when I left. Is that silly? You're locking out the fire. Well, it's horrendous. So now they live in this high school gym. But today, perhaps a glimmer of hope over the evacuation center. The rebuilding will start with memories. A 150-year-old tree, a famed landmark, burned but still standing. This is the main shelter in Maui where hundreds slept overnight. They are receiving food, shelter, and a little bit of relief from those dangerous wildfires that have upended their lives. Ellison? Dana Griffin in Maui, thank you. And there's also chaos at the Maui airport as thousands of people, mostly tourists, wait for flights to take them off the island. NBC Steve Patterson is there tonight with more. Tonight, thousands of passengers are just trying to get home. People are getting delayed. People are getting canceled. Um, baggage claims is, is a mess. It's, it's all over the place. Many still stranded in Maui's Kahului Airport, processing the devastation they managed to escape. It's just scary to see a big wildfire just kind of coming your way. And it's not something I ever experienced before. We jumped out of the car and ran as fast as we could and got out. Amy Springsteen is headed home to Oregon. She says this is what's left of her Maui rental car. She, along with some others in her party, were going to dinner when she says flames leapt onto the street. There was debris everywhere, fire falling down on top of us, but we got out safe. So far, more than 20,000 passengers have fled the island since the fires began. Thousands are still waiting. I think everybody feels safe that they've gotten here to the airport and there's food because there was no food on the island. A lot of the seats are full, a lot of people standing around just waiting for their flights. Tonight, many travelers will still call the airport home. As airlines scramble to add extra flights to get them out. American Airlines even upgraded a plane headed to Los Angeles with extra seats. On Southwest and Hawaiian Airlines, websites showing available flights from Maui to Honolulu for $19. And United Airlines saying they've canceled all inbound flights to Kahului Airport so empty planes can be used to get passengers back to the mainland. And Allison, this travel nightmare continues again tonight. People trying the best that they can to flee this island. I can tell you there's a woman who's been sleeping here in this courtyard TSA area for two nights. We've been speaking to transportation officials. They say another 14,000 people will try to flee again tonight. Allison? Steve Patterson at the Maui Airport. Thank you. For more on what is ahead for Hawaii and the summer storm slamming the mainland, Michelle Grossman joins us now. Michelle, is there any relief in sight for Maui? Hi there, Ellison. Yes, the good news is there is relief in sight. We've dropped all wind warnings, including high wind warnings. There's no red flag warnings. That's the good news. But notice we're still looking at gusty winds, winds gusting up to 35 miles per hour. So from time to time, we're starting to see these winds pick up. But the area of high pressure, the area of low pressure hurricane Dora is starting to move off to the west. That's better news. As we go throughout the next couple of hours, uh, by midnight, Hawaii central time, we're going to see winds down to 10 miles per hour. And I looked seven days out. It looks like those winds are going to stay on the uh, lower side. So the next 20 for hours, we're going to continue to see those winds subsiding. That's good news. That's going to help the firefighters. But we're still seeing winds gusting up to 35 miles per hour, 10 miles per hour by midnight tonight. But we're still in a drought condition. That was one of the ingredients. We have really dry vegetation that is fueling these storms, this wildfire. And that's what we're going to see over the next couple of days as well. Ellison? Michelle, there are also large parts of the rest of the country experiencing heavy rainfall. What areas are you watching? I know. It seems like day after day we are looking at these severe, severe storms. It's all due to this heat dome that's in place. So we're seeing these storms right along the heat dome. So right now we're looking at 14 million people at risk. Winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour. That could cause damage, bringing down trees, power lines. Also some hail. A few tornadoes are possible. We're looking at portions of the high plains and then back to the east into the Carolinas. The southern portions of Virginia where we could see some really strong storms. And then by tomorrow we're going to see that number grow as we look at portions of the Midwest. Up to 17 million. This is on Friday. Winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour once again. Could see some hail, an isolated tornado or two. And as usual, we're concerned about that heavy rainfall as well. Allison? All right, Michelle Grossman, thank you. And breaking news out of Ecuador tonight, a key candidate for president shot dead just days before the election. The assassination coming as the South American nation faces escalating violence fueled by organized crime. We want to warn you the graphic nature of some of the images you're about to see. Guad Venegas has the latest. Tonight's shock and horror in Ecuador. 
a presidential candidate assassinated in the country's capital city just days before the election. At least 12 gunshots heard in the video as Fernando Villavicencio entered a vehicle surrounded by bodyguards. Las mafias tienen los días contados. Villavicencio was running on promises to fight organized crime and corruption. Promising to take down gangs in a rally speech just moments before he was shot and killed. And just days ago, una gravísima amenaza de uno... saying death threats had been sent to him and members of his staff. The nation's attorney general office confirming nine other people, including a candidate for the legislature and two police officers were hurt in the attack. Today, police sharing images of the pistol they confirmed was used in the attack, as well as photos of the alleged six suspects that were arrested. An additional suspect was killed in a shootout with authorities. Es un crimen político. Ecuador's current president calling the killing a political crime akin to terrorism and saying it was an attempt to sabotage the election, still set to begin next weekend. The nation now under another state of emergency, just two weeks after one was declared over the assassination of a mayor in the coastal city of Manta and deadly prison riots across the country. The constant violence between rival gangs inside prisons have left scores of inmates dead, and prison guards even held hostage. Now, the nation again under a period of mourning as it fights a war against organized crime. And Guad joins us now from our Telemundo Center in Miami. Guad, what do we know about the death threats this candidate says he received? And have we heard from the U.S. in terms of this particular assassination? Ellison Villavicencio disclosed that the threats came from a known criminal who's currently incarcerated and is believed to be the head of the Sinaloa cartel in Ecuador. And the president of Ecuador has now confirmed that FBI agents are on their way. They should be arriving in the next few hours to assist with the investigation. Ellison? Guadvanegas, thank you. Next, we head overseas to Iran, where five imprisoned Americans have been placed under house arrest. It is the first step as part of a planned prisoner exchange. NBC's chief foreign affairs correspondent, Andrea Mitchell, has the late details. Tonight, five Americans are out of Tehran's notorious Evan prison and temporarily under house arrest in Iran. My belief is that uh, this is the beginning of the end of their nightmare and the nightmare that their families have experienced. Before they can come home, Iran will get $6 billion of its oil revenue for humanitarian needs. Eventually, the U.S. is also expected to release several Iranians from American jails. Held the longest, Siamat Namazi, a business consultant arrested in 2015. Murad Tabas, an environmentalist, was imprisoned in 2018 and his wife not permitted to leave Iran. Tell us um, about the experience it's... of having your parents there and not knowing how to get them home. It's obviously been a nightmare that you couldn't imagine. Imad Shargi was also arrested in 2018. His daughters told us last year the wait was agonizing, especially when a fire broke out in the prison. We thought he was dead. Um, we didn't get to speak to him for two days. Moving the six billion dollars for Iran's use could take weeks. Washington Post journalist Jason Rezaian, jailed in Tehran for almost two years, knows what they're feeling that kind of first taste of freedom, your shoulders start to loosen up just a little bit, but they don't fully uh, relax until you're out of Iranian airspace. A source familiar says separate talks could lead to an informal deal to freeze Iran's nuclear program, which U.S. officials have said is only weeks away from having enough fuel for a weapon. Ellison. Andrea Mitchell, thank you. Still ahead tonight, Target takedown. A man caught while allegedly trying to steal a TV the moment police brought him down. Plus, Twitch live streamer Kai Sanat breaking his silence after his giveaway sparked a riot in New York City. His message to those fans tonight. And an update on TV's biggest night, how the strikes in Hollywood are impacting the Emmy ceremony and the new date just set. Stay with us. Back now with an update on that chaotic New York City riot we reported on last week. The social media influencer speaking out for the first time after he drew an unruly mob for a giveaway in Union Square. NBC's Valerie Castro with what he's saying tonight. I already know there's a lot of chat. Tonight, speaking publicly for the first time, social media influencer Kai Sanat condemning the mayhem he's accused of instigating in a New York City neighborhood. I am beyond, bro, disappointed 
beyond, bro, beyond disappointed in anybody who became destructive that day, bro. 100%, bro. That is not cool. My in contrast to the message he sent to his millions of social media fans a week earlier, announcing a video gaming giveaway on his Twitch live stream, seemingly aware that things could get, quote, rowdy. 14th Street, Union Square Park, NYC, starting at 4 o'clock. My nigga might end really quick on depending on how rowdy again now look it is a public area so we don't know anything can happen bro anything can happen what did happen sent the nypd scrambling to call in resources from all five boroughs to manage the mob you are ordered to disperse the crowd made up of mostly minors exploding into a mass of people soon becoming unruly and violent <laughs> Police making arrests among the commotion while some in the crowd destroyed property, climbing on top of a newly renovated subway entrance and this food truck, even setting off fireworks. After Friday, bro, I've come to realize the amount of not only power but influence that I have on people. Sanat, at first, live streaming the crush of people around him. Where the park at? But later, the NYPD pulling the influencer out of the crowd and taking him into custody. He was eventually released from this police precinct with a desk appearance ticket for inciting to riot and unlawful assembly, according to the NYPD. I had to chill for a little bit due to the fact that, one, I got court dates that I got to appear to. My first court date, August 16th. You feel me? I got charges and stuff like that. So y'all not going to be seeing me for a little bit. Sanat vowing that the next time, if there is one, things will be different. I spoke to myself. I said, yo, Kai, next time you want to do any of, the, any of these things like this, you need to hit up the right people, make the right calls, and do it the correct way. Because as a whole, bro, we all have to do better. Valerie Castro joins us now in studio. So, Valerie, as you reported, Kai Sanat is facing charges is there any chance he could see jail time? So we spoke to our legal analyst, Danny Savalos, and he says because this came in the form of a desk appearance ticket, it is unlikely that he would face any jail time. But he says he could potentially be found liable for damage to property in a civil suit if it gets that far. Right. Allison. Valerie Castro, thank you. When we come back, late breaking news from the Supreme Court. The justice is blocking a nationwide settlement with the makers of OxyContin. The provision that would have protected the Sackler family that's holding up the deal will explain. Back now with Top Stories news feed and a shoplifting takedown in Atlanta caught on camera. Police body camera footage shows a man trying to steal a TV from a Target store, but then taking off when he sees a police officer. That officer chasing him and eventually tackling him to the ground. The man was taken into police custody and is being charged with two felonies. The Supreme Court putting the Purdue Pharma bankruptcy deal on hold. The court granting an emergency request from the Biden administration that raised objections over a provision that protected the Sackler family from liability for lawsuits. Purdue made billions from the Oxycontin painkiller that helped fuel the opioid epidemic in this country. Now to those massive Armenian American protests outside of Los Angeles. New video showing crowds waving Armenian flags, blocking lanes on a major highway. The protesters trying to draw attention to the blockades by Azerbaijan that have put some 120,000 Armenians on the brink of famine. The demonstrators specifically calling out Congressman Adam Schiff by name, who says he is in communication with the White House to push for more humanitarian aid. And the writer's strike is not just having an, an effect on your favorite shows. This time, it is also impacting the Emmys. The upcoming 75th Emmy Awards have been delayed by nearly four months. The award show typically airs in September. They're now scheduled for January 15th. Now to the effort to keep children from going hungry at school. During the pandemic, Congress passed free school meals for all kids, but that has expired, leaving states to figure out what to do next. Stephen Romo shows us how Massachusetts just got a major win. The pain of hunger can make learning much harder, which is why Massachusetts is joining a small group of states signing on to a universal free school meal program. It's a big relief, um, especially for families. Nobody wants to see a child go hungry. And unfortunately for some of our children, that could be the only meal that they receive during the day. 
Governor Maura Healey signing the state's budget Wednesday, approving funding for that program. So their bellies won't be grumbling in their schools while they're trying to get work done. The state effort is estimated to save families $1,200 per student per year. Enjoy your lunch. An issue that goes far beyond state borders. More than 9 million children still faced hunger in 2021. A popular pandemic era federal program meant to address this made free school meals available to all children regardless of family income. There is that sense of pride um, as a parent or as a guardian, uh, what have you, that you don't want people to know that you're struggling. To see this all happen and watch us collectively go through this, uh, this financial crisis, this pandemic, um, watching people struggle, it's extremely heartbreaking. But funding dried up last year, meaning it's up to each state or individual school districts to figure out what to do next. There are campaigns in more than 20 states across the country pushing for universal free school meals. But Massachusetts is only the eighth state to get the plan across the finish line. We know that when kids are hungry, they can't focus, they can't concentrate, they can't learn. And so by making sure that every child in this country is in class, well nourished and ready to learn, will have a huge impact on the economy and kids' outcomes. Now, Allison, some states temporarily extended these free meals after the federal funds ended, but many of them did not. And student debt for their meals immediately started climbing, leaving districts to try to figure out what to do next. Some of them sending these to collection agencies, others even punishing the students, making them sit out activities due to this. The Food Research Council, by the way, through all of this says their polling shows that nationally there's 63 percent support for making these federal universities universal free meal programs permanent. Elson. Stephen Rummo, thank you. Now to top stories, Global Watch and an investigation into a devastating fire that killed 11 people in eastern France. French authorities say mandatory safety standards were not met at a vacation home that housed adults with learning disabilities. The fire started on the upper floor and then spread quickly, leaving no chance for the people inside to escape. No word yet on what initially caused that blaze. Now to the typhoon slamming into South Korea. Officials say more than 10,000 people have been evacuated. Schools and roadways closed. Hundreds of flights also canceled. At least one person has died. The storm is expected to weaken as it heads towards North Korea. And China is lifting a pandemic ban on tour groups to more than 70 locations, including here in the U.S. China's Ministry of Culture and Tourism said the tours will resume in Asia, Pacific, Europe, Africa and North America for the first time in three years. Uh, the move is set to boost global tourism around the world as travel and airline stocks surge. Staying with China and an NBC News exclusive, for the Uyghurs, the predominantly Muslim minority group in China, Turkey used to be a safe haven from repression. But now a new human rights report shared exclusively with NBC News shows there's a disturbing trend of efforts by China to allegedly target Uyghurs exiled. NBC's chief international correspondent Keir Simmons has the story. Tonight, Idris Hassan is in a prison in Morocco. His wife and young daughter, thousands of miles away in Turkey, listening in to our phone call as he tells us about his two-year nightmare. Sometimes very, I cannot breathe. Hassan was arrested by Moroccan authorities, wanted by China under an Interpol red notice, which Interpol confirms has since been dropped. He's a member of the mostly Muslim Uyghur minority from China. The Chinese government accused by the US of committing genocide against the Uyghurs. More than a million were put through what Beijing calls re-education camps, separating families. While in exile, Hassan campaigned against that treatment. China calls that terrorism and wants him extradited. He says he's innocent and now his wife and three children live in fear. You must miss them. I miss very, very much my family. I have a picture of my family. I cannot see this picture. If I see this picture, I am very upset. I am crying for myself. More than 50,000 Uyghurs have sought refuge in Turkey, but they haven't escaped their fear of China. Tonight, a new report obtained exclusively by NBC News documents disturbing efforts by China to allegedly target exiled Uyghurs. We have your father and sister. You'll never see them again if you don't collaborate with us, the report says one anonymous victim was told. 
The report by Safeguard Defenders, a non-profit human rights group highly critical of the Chinese government, describes cases like Jevlan Shememet, living in Turkey, who says his family was forced to call him from China and urged him not to speak up on human rights. When you got that phone call, did you believe that they were speaking? I know that the phone call is belong to the Chinese police department. The report's author, Yalkun Aluyo, tells us he's a victim himself. How many of your friends and relatives have been imprisoned? Back and forth, about 30 of my relatives from my father's side. 30? On back just and, your father's back side? Back and forth, yes. Some of them uh, were detained in the camps for a few years and then released, and some of them are still serving. My father is serving 16 years in prison for nothing. My uncle is serving life sentence for nothing. My uncle-in-law, who was taken from a hospital bed, is serving 15 years in prison for nothing. The Chinese embassy in Washington tells NBC News China is ruled by law. It cannot be accused of torture, persecution or arbitrary detention against Uyghurs. It's not about human rights, ethnicity or religion. It's about fighting violence, terrorism and separatism. But this year, a UN working group concluded the detentions of Uyghurs was based on discrimination and their Muslim faith. And two years since he was arrested, Idris Hassan told us he is innocent. What do you fear will happen if you're sent to China? If you're sent to China, then you're equal to death for me. Because you know, China... NBC's chief international correspondent, Keir Simmons, joins us now. Keir, picking up where your piece left off, for Idris, he's still a prisoner in Morocco. Do we know what happens next for him? We don't know, Edison, and nor does he, and frankly, nor do his legal representatives. Although, when we spoke to him, uh, we got the impression that he doesn't see those lawyers very often, maybe once every uh, few months. His main communication with the outside world is that cell phone call that you saw us having with him and, and his wife. It's limited to 15 minutes. That's how he finds out, you know, what is going on. He says, he told us that he, he reads books, he tries not to think Think about his fate. It's clear, Ellison, that China still wants him. They still have an extradition request for him. They say he's a separatist and a terrorist. He told us on that line from that prison in Morocco, I am innocent. Hmm. Kier, when it comes to Turkey, what changed there for it to no longer be a safe haven for Uyghurs? Well, listen, we should be clear. There are 45,000 Uyghurs there in Turkey. Uh, that's the biggest diaspora of, of, of Uyghurs anywhere else in the world outside of China. So the, the, they have done a lot. In 2016, the so-called One Belt, One Road uh, economic trade policy was signed with Turkey, as with many other countries. And that does appear to have, uh, have seen a shift. President Erdogan of Turkey did call the treatment of the Uyghurs a genocide. Uh, but now, though, they seem to be pursued more than ever uh, in Turkey with that proviso. Again, that Turkey has done a lot. There are a lot of Uyghur refugees uh, there in Turkey. Inter interestingly, Idris Hassan was trying to get to Europe. He didn't feel safe in Turkey anymore. He thought he would be safe through a Muslim country like Morocco. Turned out he was wrong about that. And it just underscores the point, you know, Edison, that, that these Uyghurs, they've left China, but they still don't feel safe. Keir Simmons, thank you. Coming up next, streaming prices soaring. The two subscription services following in Netflix's footstep and raising their prices. That's next. We're back with the growing expenses for cord cutters as the cost for streaming services continue to increase. Disney announcing that the ad-free plans for Disney Plus and Hulu will increase by more than 20 percent, effective in October. This comes as Peacock, owned by our parent company NBC Universal, is raising prices on both its premium and premium plus subscriptions. And back in July, Netflix announced it will no longer offer its cheapest ad-free plan at $9.99 per month to new users. Let's bring in 
Nasia Fulcher, supervising editor for Deals at Wirecutter. Nasia, we just named some of like the biggest every platform possible right. where you stream. All of them raising prices. Mm -hmm. All of them cracking down on password sharing. It's kind of insane, no? Why so much and why all right now? Ah, uh, you know, I I don't want to blame the writer strike. I don't want to blame the actor strike, but what I will say is that there's only so much content that is already prepackaged and ready to go, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, there might be things in the middle of writing, in the middle of actually shooting, and we have to remember that production schedule. So because these streaming services only have so much in the backlog, mm -hmm. they're, you know, they're basically preparing for the worst, which unfortunately is bad for everybody's pocket, including mine. <laughs> <laughs> Did Netflix announcing their password crackdown, mm -hmm. that sort of kick the dominoes to lead to this? I mean, Netflix in general, they have been raising their prices every couple of years since its inception. Um, before it was about $8.00. Now it's fifteen fifty, right? Mm -hmm. Including an extra eight dollars um, for folks who have other people in their household, my um, sister. right? Or my mine, mom. right? Yes. Exactly. <laughs> or my dad, or you know, everybody's yeah. sharing, but yeah. no one can share anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's an extra eight dollars if you do want to share, which is again, like not in everyone's budget, you know? Whatever happened to cable TV? <laughs> what is the best <laughs> advice for people though, who are like, look, I love streaming, I love the programs on this mm -hmm. platform, this, I don't wanna get rid of it, but I'm also worried about what this is gonna do to my budget. Right, right, I think the number one thing is to consolidate. Think about all of the shows that you love and then figure out where they live. Once you figure out where they live, whether it be Max, Hulu, Peacock, Netflix, um, you know, you'll, make a plan and see what, where the most of your shows live. And then the ones on the least, just cut them out. You know, unfortunately, we're just at a point where do you want to spend, you know, 150 bucks total on five different streaming services? Probably not. Um, the next thing I would say is to definitely take advantage of any of these free trials. Um, anyone who's anyone who has an iPhone has seen the Apple TV Plus uh, free trials, three month trials, make sure to look into that. If you're a Target Circle member, for example, you can take advantage of those sales. So they'll have you know a three month trial, but make sure that you set a reminder yeah. to take that yes. off okay. <laughs> so that you're not uh -huh. paying it the next month. Yes. Nasia Fulcher, thank you for joining us. We will be right back. Thank you so much for watching Top Story. For Tom Yamas, I'm Ellison Barber in New York. Stay right there. More News Now is on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.